Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to each and every one of you. We are live. So here we are. It's time for class. Let me say to each of you, um, over the last week, some of you, as you followed our posts, good morning, Omar. I see you here. Omar Miranda, Nathan Zink, Tanya, Charlene Garrison, blessings to you. Floor, ah, Guadalajara, all oh, blessings to you, my friend. Blessings to you. Danny Shepard, blessings. Deborah Hayden, blessings to you. I see each one of you on here. Linnell, I see you up there. Each one of you, you've joined us on a Saturday morning, and I thank God for you. I honor you. <coughs> Excuse me. My apologies. Looks like we have 124 registered for the class, so some of them will see it over the next day or so. Gifty Edwards, Sacramento in the house. I should have known, my friend. Tanya, I see you there. Sinead Rich, come on. Happy Saturday to you. I just greet each one of you in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for your patience. Uh, the last week, um, some of it was technical difficulty. Also, some of it was the Lord kept apprehending me and saying, I want you to pray. And uh, for about three days, we got very intense prayer requests coming in. And so the Lord said to me, you've been teaching, but now just pray. And so I literally spent time just praying for people and asking God for breakthroughs. And so uh, the Lord spoke to me one night and said, you've been teaching and you'll go back to teaching, but I need you to stop talking to people and just pray. Ah, uh, we are walking out the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> well, Nathan, you had no idea, but that's exactly where we're starting. Patrick Adams, blessings to you, sir, and thank you. To Patrick and Angela, thank you for all of your work. Patrick is the one with Angela. They have been keeping me on task and keeping things flowing and keeping you informed. And so they had everything flowing um, at the last minute shifts and changes. I thank God for both of them. They move with the shifting and changes without letting shifts and changes affect them. And so they were able to let you know and keep you informed. So I thank God. I thank God for people who work with me, who help me. And it doesn't become um, a burden or it doesn't become um, an issue, any of the changes. They know that so are they that move by the spirit. You have to move like the water. As, ah, Patrick said it before I could say it, as the wind goes. That is the presence of the spirit of God. And I've been talking to so many pastors, even from around the world over this last week, who many of them, their largest complaint and their biggest need is they said they no longer see people moving by the spirit. And so they forgot what that is. And that is the beauty of the Lord. We have become so structured. We have forgot that the Holy Spirit moves well, whatsoever he chooses. And he does whatsoever he wills. And we have become so that we call that flaky. But it's only flaky until you need the power of God. And when you need the power of God, you need people who will shut down preaching and ministry and go lay on their face. You need to be connected to ministries and churches that will shut down their Sunday service and just say, we're going to stand around the altar until that child in the ICU comes out, until your husband who has been in an accident gets a clear report, until your daughter who tried to take her life comes out of this okay. We need to go back to ministry that connects to power because a good service cannot change your life, but a good God can. And so God is calling us back. Oh, Laura Shula, come on. I see you this morning. God is calling us to recognize that it is by his power not by our program or our plan. It is by his power, Wendy Mark. I thank God for you and for Danny. I thank God. Some of you were gathered this morning, even in prayer. And um, I just thank God, Sandra, who I know is back home now. But for each one of you, I just bless you. <clears throat> Samantha, I see you on here this morning. Blessings to you. And we have people now joining us from different parts of the world. In the last class, we had students, uh, people joining us from New Zealand. They were joining us from Switzerland. We had people joining us from England. We had people uh, even in Africa. And so I want you to know these classes as they're growing, some are watching them live with us, but some are coming by the next day and seeing them. And so we're able to see the analytics and realize that people are joining you in class from different parts of the world. Ah, uh, I see you. 
um, let's see here. Munai, Munai Waki. I see you on here. I hope I said that correctly, but blessings to you as you come into uh, this class. And I'm just talking for a few minutes, giving others a chance to join. As Nathan said, you're walking out the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm going to actually break into teaching on the Sermon on the Mount as we begin to connect the mind of the kingdom and the mind of Christ. And we look through the prism of the kingdom. So I want to say that in particular. Ginger Knot, we say blessings to you. Good morning to you and welcome. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Yes, a great use of technology. That's our desire to use everything God has created to touch as many people as possible with the kingdom of God. The prism of the kingdom. The prism of the kingdom. For many of you, when we were small, when we were little, we know what a prism is, um, a kaleidoscope, a prism, a refractor or reflector, something that breaks down light and causes it to be seen in a multifaceted way. For many of you, you when you were small or even now, upon some of your um, lights hanging in your room, Joshua Rollinson, come on, let's roll, baby. Upon the lights hanging in your room, or you used to have them hanging in the window, or your grandparents had them hanging on the porch, they would have a glass, a prism, that would be a multifaceted reflector. And when the light would hit it just right, a little rainbow would be spread out on the wall. Some of our grandparents, I remember the little ones they used to hang, that would hang like a wind chime. And it would be made of glass, but it would hang. And as the wind would blow, you would get this explosion of light and sound. A prism is a piece of glass um, that has been formed in such a way that light is broken down into its multifaceted spectrum. In other words, when light comes to you, when the light shines to you, when the sun is shining, you're not actually seeing the color of light. You're seeing light itself. You're seeing the explosion of the gases and the chemicals that are making up the sun. And when it explodes, it produces this incandescence. It's like lighting a candle. It's like turning on a um, torch. It's like turning on the lights in your house. But when you break down light, inside of what we would call white light or the light that gives us the ability to see, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, is every other color. So there is purple, orange, yellow, red, blue, green. All of that is already existent like a rainbow. It already exists inside of, yes, it already exists inside of what you are being, what brings you revelation has more in it than what you see. So the light that reveals life, <clears throat> the life, the light that reveals light. I'm going to say that again. The light that reveals life, L-I-F-E. The L-I-G-H-T, the light that reveals L-I-F-E. So you do not know what life is around you until the light turns on. You do not know what's in the room until you flip on the switch. You do not know what's in the darkness until you turn on the torch. You do not know what's hiding in the campground until you light the fire. So the light, thank you, Deborah, Danny, thank you both as you are helping uh, put the typing out there, keeping the words flowing. As we keep the light on, more life is revealed. So there is life in Christ you've never seen because God in his multifaceted way, he has to let you break down what is hiding inside of one truth. Now, inside of every revelation is a multifaceted level of truth. Inside of every word, there is more than just that word. So when God says to you, blessed, what does blessing mean? Because depending on how you define blessing, depending on how you define salvation, depending on how you define health, depending on how you define God, you will either see all of him or none of him. You will see the fullness of the scripture or you'll see only one portion of the scripture. So if there is seven parts to a truth and you only have seen one part, you are walking in immaturity. 
if there's 10 levels to that revelation and you are stuck at level one, then you and your mind have already received the truth, but you've never entered into the depth of the word because you're only seeing what the light revealed, but you still haven't seen the light. Inside of the light is the colors. Inside of the light. So now, John chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and was not anything made that was made that was not made by him. In him was life. And the life became the light of the world. So the very revelation of the word of God in John chapter one is that God is light and life. Both those things brings us back to understanding. If you don't understand what light is, you will miss what life brings. So the Bible says in John chapter one is that the word is life and that life is light. But it also says the light shine in darkness and the darkness comprehended him not. So when light comes, if your comprehension does not grow to the level of the revelation, you received nothing. Oh, so if Jesus shows up and he turns on the light and he is shining in front of you and the shining glory of God is revealing to you another level of who he is. But your denomination says he only gives a little bit. He only heals this. He doesn't do that. At the moment you stop seeing him, the light stops producing for you. The light is still multifaceted. The light is still incandescent. The light is still revelatory. The power of God is still there. The levels are still present, but you cannot access it because you shut down your comprehension based on what you heard people say. So there's eight more blessings inside of that revelation, but you only received two because someone told you it's only two there. So you stop looking. Ah. When you stop looking, you stop receiving. So the Bible says, if you're going to <coughs> receive from God, excuse me, knock. But before you knock, you got to ask. But you got to ask. And then something has to happen in between the knocking. Ask, seek. Ah. So the first thing God does is he brings you revelation. The revelation is to produce a question. The revelation is to produce a question. Every revelation in God in the kingdom is to lead you to search for him, to seek for him, to go looking for more. The kingdom of God is built on hide and seek. <laughs> Ooh, the kingdom of God is built on hide and seek. As a child, one of the things I love the most, come on, y'all scripture, y'all got scripture this morning. Y'all better work that word. Yes, Laura Shula, you are right on it. Proverbs 25 and two. So the kingdom of God is built on hide and seek. God reveals so that you can begin to seek. Now, if you don't understand that God is revealing so that you will seek, that he's showing so that you'll chase him, then God says, you're satisfied with the level you already have. So since God is a steward and he does not waste revelation, God will stop talking when you stop seeking. I'm going to say that again. God stops talking when you stop seeking. So for many people who say, well, I haven't heard God speak in such a long time. Have you sought him? for the last thing he said. In other words, you had a dream, you had a revelation, you had a vision, you had a prophetic word. Did you write that word down, put it in a notebook, and then you're waiting for it to come to pass? Or did you seek God based on the word? Did you seek? Did you go looking? Did you turn up the covers, look underneath the bed, 
pull out the shoes in the closet, go through the pockets hanging in your laundry? Did you go on a journey of discovery that you might find the wisdom that God has hidden for you? That he's not holding from you, he hid it for you. God is not trying to leave you in darkness. He's trying to give you greater light. So God says the only way to give you greater light is I've got to get you to pursue the revelation I give you because the pursuit of the revelation is the building of the kingdom. The building of maturity, the building of knowledge. So how do you build knowledge in the kingdom? Pursue truth. So God says, first, I'll speak when I speak. I'm expecting you to ask me something or seek after truth. So God says to you, you shall have a ministry. You shall touch the world. You shall write a book. Your seeking should be what kind of book? What kind of ministry? What are you telling me to do? How shall I serve? How shall I yield myself? What more are you looking for? What can I dig into? Who can I study? Who's already doing what I'm doing? What books can I add to my pursuit of the greatness of God? What songs can I sing that keep my mind connected? What can I read that keeps my spirit stirred? Where can I go and sit and listen in a congregation that builds me and doesn't break me? Who has already conquered the mountain that I'm in the valley below looking up to? Then I need to attach myself to them and say, mentor me. Have you sought after what God gave you? Now that's the asking. In the kingdom, the next, se the next series of events is ask, now seek, seek, ask, seek. So the first thing is asking. We all start with asking. Asking is in prayer. So I've already jumped past that. You have to ask, you have to seek. Now is knocking. Now what is knocking? Asking is simply the pursuit of the heart that based on what God has revealed himself to be, you begin in prayer and in worship to pull on the presence. So it's your radar. You're looking for something. That's the asking. Now the seeking is, now that God reveals what he is speaking to you, you now have to put energy and time into what God has revealed to you. Look for a mentor. Look for a place to study. Look for information. Invest yourself. That's the second level. Now the third level is knocking. Now knocking requires what? You can only knock with your hand. I'm going to say that again. Culturally, we understand that knocking requires the hand, the, the fist, the hand to be put into. So whether you would knock on the side, you would knock with the knuckles, you would knock with the back of the hand, or you would punch the door. However you do it, culturally, historically, all knocking when you go back to even the ancient doors and they would put this knocker on the front and you would raise it up and slam it down, that was by the hand. So what is God saying? God now says knocking has to do with what you put your hand to do. Ha ah, ah! ha! So what is knocking about? Knocking is about work your revelation. Now that you have read and studied, now that you've been mentored, now that you've been in a place that teaches you, now that you've got enough revelation in you, you need to start hitting the resistance in front of you with the truth that is in you. In other words, work your gift. Knock that door down. For your gift makes room for you. You don't need 50 people to like you. You don't need 70 people to tell you you're phenomenal. You don't need 80 people to recommend you as being the only one in the world that can do what you do. You just need to work your gift. Your gift will make room for you. Be excellent at what you do. So what does knocking mean? It means you've got to practice. See, the seeking is I'm discovering who I am. I'm discovering where he's calling me. I'm discovering who can help me. I'm discovering what will feed me. I'm discovering what I don't need. I'm discovering who is not on my side. I'm discovering what will get me to the mountain and what will keep me in the valley. I'm discovering some people's prayers push me into destiny and some people's prayers almost make me want to commit suicide. So I need to stay away from them. Some people's advice gets me over the hump and some people's advice keeps me wrapped up like a mummy. So in the seeking phase, I'm discovering 
who to connect to and who to leave alone. Now, once those connections are made, you now have to take the final step. What's the final step? What door are you knocking on? See, now knocking, that last point of knocking in the kingdom is the place of resistance. Why? Because when you begin to knock on doors, you now have to suffer men's answers. Oh, I hope this is helping you. This is good teaching this morning. When you begin to knock on doors, now you're working your gift. Now you're working your gift. Now you're working your gift. Okay. As you're working your gift, now you have to suffer criticism. You have to suffer men's agendas. You have to suffer people's rejections. You have to suffer the yes and no of people because you now have finally discovered who you are. You've discovered what you're good at. You are now comfortable in you, but that doesn't mean everybody is comfortable with you. <laughs> See, while the whole world is trying to figure out who they are, while they're fighting rejection, and isolation and feeling disconnected while the whole world is still talking kingdom, but they're living church while the whole world is wrestling with religion and they're trying to hold you hostage to their expectation of you while everybody else tells you be great. But as soon as you become great, they want to kill you in infancy because you becoming great makes them look small. So you now have been exposed to the revelation that the folks around you are not really always for you. And at that moment, you now have to make a decision. Do I keep knocking or do I yield to the pressure of small-minded people who are afraid of who I'm becoming? Do I yield to the pressure of people telling me you're too loud, you're too much, you're too confrontational, you're too directional? Why have you got to talk like you know who you are? Why do you have to point out when we're making mistakes? Why are you, see, you being convinced of who you are is not making others look small. It makes them feel small. So this is why it's important. You have to understand when you begin to get into the place of knocking on doors and declaring who you are and declaring what God has told you to do, when you begin to work your gift and bring it into the earth, you have to understand that everybody around you who is still unstable, unsure, rejected in their mentality and their emotions, they now see you as a threat. How dare you? Act like you know where you're going when the rest of us are walking in a circle. How dare you act like you know something we don't know. I'm going to tell you something that I hope this will help you. And I hope this is blessing y'all because I, I, I feel like God's been talking to me so much the last few weeks. I've got notebooks full, notebooks, notebooks, notebooks. I'm so excited about teaching. It's just changing my whole mindset. The moment Jesus comes into the earth, Everything in creation understood that he brought a different kingdom. Now, hang on, because we're going to keep walking through this and we're going to the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to just think from the kingdom now. Jesus is born in a manger. Oh, yes, Appy, yes. This, these teachings we're doing, you're going to have to keep replaying them. That's why we're making them available and this we're recording them all because I hope this goes down in your spirit. That's why I'm keeping these materials to teach like this, because I want to teach in such detail that what we teach in an hour and a half, you've got to listen to four or five times. I want people to have to break it down and digest it because I'm tired of us getting an hour long message that only had five minutes worth of material. We should be getting an hour's worth of material in five minutes. That's the power of the kingdom. Because when you look at what Jesus said, what he said in a few verses, we're still chewing on for 2,000 years. So you're telling me you've had your whole life to study the Bible and that's all you had to say in 60 minutes? That's it? We sat and listened to you for an hour and a half and that's all you said? Really? then you have now revealed to me you didn't spend time with him or his word. Because if you sit with him long enough, he'll talk deep enough 
that the word itself will build upon itself and suddenly the word will speak in the middle of the person speaking and revelation in the middle of information and information will turn to education and education will lead to manifestation and manifestation will lead to demonstration and suddenly in the middle of somebody talking God shows up to talk himself about his own word. Oh, the word is so good. You got to work hard to mess up scripture. So, ah, I'm getting excited. So Jesus is born in a manger. Now, you, you are phenomenal thinkers. So think about this with me. We're about to go back to ask, seek, and knock. Jesus now is born in a manger. What is a manger? A manger is a place of lowly estate where animals are corralled. It wasn't really a barn. Now you got to understand, he was in a temporary location. It's where people who were coming to the inn or to the hotel, it's where they were storing. So there were a few animals in that manger that were always there. Most of the other animals that were there were the horses and the mules that people had ridden because they were coming into Jerusalem for the time of sacrifice, for the time of celebration. So there was an extra number. There were also some of the animals that were being brought to be uh, slaughtered. So people had brought in some sheep and some goats. So you've got to think about this. Jesus is now in a manger, a rented space. And he's in a rented space that animals have filled. Now we go, he was born in a manger. Was he? Was he born in a manger? Well, yes, but no. Because what we forget is the power of the kingdom. Wherever a king sets up his government, that place for that moment becomes governmental territory. So it was a manger until Mary began to crown. Isn't it funny when we say that a child is coming through the womb, we call it their crowning. Ah. <laughs> so suddenly, Mary begins to, the baby begins to crown. It means his head is coming through her matrix. So as his head is coming out of his mama, they call it a crowning. <laughs> oh, Linnell, you're walking with me. So the moment his head broke through his mama, the manger became an embassy. Hey! The animals became government representatives. So now the sound of the animals did not sound to God like an insult. It sounded like the creation back in the garden. The same sound he heard when animals were the first ones who were praising him because he made men on the last day. Let everything that has breath give him praise. So animals were praising him before humans began to worship him. So now here comes the king and he's crowning and as he comes out of mary suddenly angels begin to surround the manger and the glory of heaven makes a manger into a ministry and the manger becomes an embassy and the embassy becomes the throne now wherever a king is sitting it's now a throne so when jesus is pulled up out of mary and she holds him in her arms suddenly all of heaven says wait a minute the prince that was on the throne has now taken new territory. Behold, the king of glory and the manger became a kingdom. And the animals became witnesses to a government takeover. <laughs> hey, so the ox and the donkey and the horse bowed their head and said, your majesty. The chicken and the dove and the sheep and the goat said, your majesty. All the angels began to bow their wings together and said, your majesty. 
all of a sudden the father in heaven looked down and said behold my son is born now among men and unto you a son shall be a child shall be born and unto you a son shall be given and the government shall be upon his shoulders so suddenly a kingdom began to rest in the middle of a manger now the problem was nobody asked any questions? Nobody sought except for three wise men who understood what? They understood because they had been asking the right question. When shall he come? Because they had been asking the right question, they started to seek knowledge. When they started seeking knowledge, it says the wise men, the magi, the kings of the Orient, they began to seek, where shall he be born? Because they were asking and seeking, they started to knock on doors, nation after nation. They began to say, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? So they asked, then they sought, then they knocked. They knocked so much that Herod heard they were coming. And when Herod heard they were coming, he brought them before him and said, are you seeking a king? We are. Do you know where he is? We got an idea. And they understood from the revelation not to tell Herod what they understood. Why? Because if he's born in your city, you should have been asking questions before we got here. The fact that you didn't ask the right question lets me know we're not in the same class. Oh, the fact that you don't know the right question means you haven't been studying the same material. So you want to know, is he coming to overthrow me? We just want to know, can we find him so we can worship? You want to know, is this the end of your dominion? We are happy to say we are done being kings. We just want to be servants. So we're in two different schools. We're in two different classes. You're studying to try to find out how to be included. We're studying so we can be humble. You're studying so you can keep your power. We're studying so we can yield our authority. You're studying so you can get a stage. We're studying so we can get to an altar. So the questions that we're both asking are a revelation that we think differently. The very revelation that we're thinking differently, the prism. Now that we see the light, the light is revealing that we are in two different spectrums. The fact that you are in another spectrum means I can't share with you what I've been receiving from God because the revelation that's leading me to an encounter will lead you to destruction. So I've got to leave you alone because the wrong question has revealed we don't think the same. Oh, 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 oh. oh. so now. Two different spectrums, two different kingdoms, two different mindsets. This is why Jesus says over and over, when they would come to ask him a question, depending on the question, he would respond with a rebuke or with revelation. This is essential. You've got to now pay attention to many of you as God is bringing you into your destiny and into your next assignment, you must begin to pay attention to what people are saying around you because the wrong questions reveal wrong motives. Their questions reveal their motives. Their questions reveal their motives. See, in the kingdom of God, a question is a revelation of what you understand because God is not hiding from you. He's hiding for you. He's not taking to lessen you He's increasing you by bringing you on a journey. So you have to now understand that in the kingdom, now look differently. When Jesus is now talking to people and he says these words, when they would ask a question, how long have I been with you and you still don't understand me? How long have I been with you and you still don't know me? So what was he saying? Your question offends me. 
Your question reveals you. Your question astounds me. Your very question is not your desire to know. Your question is a revelation that you've never listened to what I had to say. Your question is a revelation that you were after power, not my presence. Your question is a revelation that you wanted money, not ministry. Your question is a revelation that you wanted to be included, but you never wanted to be transformed. Therefore, I need you to know that your question has made it clear you are not fit for the kingdom. Oh, oh, so it's a completely different understanding that Jesus was not harsh. Now look back at the Old Testament. The Old Testament now reveals to us that when God shows up and he now says to the people, if you had simply did what I told you to do, would it not have been well with you? What was he saying? The fact that you refuse to listen is a revelation that your heart doesn't belong to me. So he's not talking about legalism. He's not talking about being legalistic. He's not talking about keeping 150 different laws every day of your life. What he's saying is the art of listening is the first and final test of maturity. The art of listening is the first and final test of maturity for the kingdom is built on the ears of the faithful the kingdom is built on the ears of the faithful the first of your senses and and i haven't forgot where we're going we're going to continue to go um, i've got to remove i got something that just sorry something flew onto my screen so i had to get it off there okay <laughs> The first of your senses that begins to work is hearing. When a child is still in the womb, a baby is inside of its mother. When mama talks to that child every day, if she will make her voice known, that's why so many men, fathers, who will sit beside, excuse me, who will sit beside their pregnant wife and they will speak and say, hello, little one, I'm your father. Do you know that if you do that up until the time the child is born, the child will come out of the womb knowing the voice of mom and daddy. That's why when mama enters the room, that's why many times you may feel so overwhelmed because your child only stops crying when you speak. Oh, Laura says Ellie did that. That's right. Or when you or your husband will come into the room and, and speak and say, hey, I'm here. It's okay. And they'll calm down. Why? Because your two voices are the only voices they know. Why is that? Because Papa is with Mama all the time. And if he speaks to the womb, the child is hearing Papa's voice, the intonations, the levels, and Mama's voice has an extra magnifying system because Mama doesn't have to always speak so loud because just when you talk, your very body is carrying your sound waves down into your womb. The child is held in liquid. So like being in a swimming pool and someone puts a megaphone into the top of the water and you speak into that megaphone, the water moves. And it carries sound is carried by waves so it is true that when a child is inside of the womb they can hear sound so the first thing that begins to activate inside of you is the ability to hear inside of your mama's womb okay the last of your senses to operate is hearing this is why when someone is in a coma or they have come out of an operation the doctors and nurses will say, go talk to them. For even though they cannot move, even though they're hooked up to monitors, even though they've got IVs and they've got different connectors all over them, talk to them. We can see that on the brainwave monitor, it moves when you speak. 
So suddenly we understand that the first sense to be activated is sound. The last sense to go, sound. Therefore, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God was talking to you before you knew him in your mama's womb. While you were yet in sin, he was calling you. While you were yet in poverty, he was calling you. While you were still in depression, he was calling you. Somebody who's in witchcraft, somebody who's an atheist, somebody who's an unbeliever, somebody who was raised to hate God and hate the church. God is still talking to them. They're in their mama's womb. They're not yet born again. They haven't come into the kingdom, but the spirit is still calling them. He's wooing them. He's speaking to them. The kingdom is still bringing them to itself for the kingdom sees all flesh as belonging to God. They're in the womb but they're still worthy of the voice. And the last is the voice. That at the end of your life, God is still calling you, talking to you, whispering to you. So the kingdom is built on the ear of those that hear. We move at the speed of obedience. We build at the speed of hearing. I'm gonna say that again. We move at the speed of obedience, but we build at the speed of hearing. How quickly and deeply we all hear together will be the level that we get to build. So when we all who are called to operate together in one location, in one place, in one generation, hear the Lord together equally, that level gets built, it gets finished. Then the Lord speaks another word and the prophets come and declare another word. And when that word begins to get loose to a generation, as we walk in equity, unity, the spirit of peace and power, and we begin to come together, then that level gets built. And now we're two levels up and so on and so on until a city is changed, a nation is reformed, a generation moves forward. Level upon level, the glory of God builds based on how we move together in unity, equity, and the spirit of peace and power. That is how we build. But how we move forward, once you build, you get stuck in every generation if we stop obeying. So we heard the word and we built what God said together. But once we finish building, if we stop obeying, we get stuck. So we heard what God was saying. That's how you build a denomination. But if we keep hearing what God is saying, that's a movement. That's revival. That's the stirring of nations. So obedience, continual obedience with an open ear leads to building that never stops moving. Building that never stops moving. You can keep moving without ever building. That's called a flash fire. That is a momentary revival. That is the power of God that visits in one ministry, one generation. It's the power of God that only shows up for five years. It's when somebody starts something and we go, man, this thing is on fire. But in five years, nobody knows who you are. They'll never hear of you again. Why? Because you burn out, you fizzle out. Because everything you had was in you hearing that one revelation and then you ran with it, but you built no unity. It wasn't stable. You didn't get others to hear God. You didn't wait for other people to grow. You left everybody behind. So when you refuse to let the kingdom influence the community, build unity and bring others together, you run faster than people and you never form community. So you end up being offended at people who don't follow and you never produce anything in the earth. Woo! So now, oh, come on, Gifty Edwards, yes. And old revelation produces denominations. Yes, Wendy Mark. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And Gifty, the next word that was so important, he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. The word that heaven declares, the father speaks, is this is my son, the continuation. Okay, let's look at it from the kingdom. 
every word we're looking at from the kingdom. When the father speaks, so heaven, the kingdom of heaven is now declaring publicly 30 years later over the prince who represents the kingdom. Jesus shall now be the voice of the kingdom, the face of the kingdom, and the demonstration of the kingdom. He is the voice of the kingdom, the face of the kingdom, and the demonstration of the king. One more time. He is the voice of the kingdom, the face of the kingdom, excuse me, and the demonstration of the king. He's the voice of the kingdom. In other words, every prophet you heard up until now was good. But you are not to refer back to other prophets in comparison to what Jesus is saying. You are to refer to them simply to extrapolate what they said and then connect it to what Jesus is declaring. Let me make that simple. If you are going back to quote Moses, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, or Micah, Habakkuk, or Nahum, if you are going back to quote Haggai, or any of the minor prophets or their work, if you are quoting any of the prophets and then saying, well, Jesus said this, but the prophet said that, you are ignorant of the kingdom because Jesus was not a continuation of the kingdom. He was the voice of the kingdom. So when Jesus shows up, everything that had been spoken before Jesus has to now be filtered through his voice. That's why Jesus says, you say Moses said, but it was not so. You say that the prophets declare this, but it is not so. So let me say it again. Every word from every other prophet has to be filtered through the voice of Jesus, through the words of Jesus, sifted through the words of Jesus, tested by the words of Jesus. It has to line up with the words of Jesus. You do not cross compare the Old Testament prophets with Jesus' words as though they have to um, line up like Jesus doesn't sound like them. No, 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 no. You look at their words and say, whatever they said that don't sound like Jesus, then it ain't him. That's why Jesus said, wait a minute, Moses told you that you could have all these laws, but it was never the will of the Father. Jesus says to them, Every law that Moses gave to you outside of the Ten Commandments, it was not my father's desire for you to have those laws. He had to give them to you because of your disobedience. But the only law that the father wanted you to have was the Ten. Woo! This is why it's so important. Come on, Danny Shepherd. That's right. This is where stuff gets strange. When people hear all these other teachings and they go, I like this teaching, but Jesus didn't say it quite this way. So I'll find four other ways to make this teaching work. No, Jesus is the law. He is the kingdom. He is the word. So whatever they said that doesn't line up with Jesus, I'm not saying throw it away. I'm saying you did not understand it correctly. Ha <laughs> ha. That's why Jesus says, you keep quoting Moses to me. You keep telling me what Moses said, but I am the law. I wrote the Ten Commandments. I gave the law to Moses. Don't tell me what the law says. I'm telling you, Moses gave you all those laws because you couldn't control yourself. But now that I have come, now that I shall live inside of you, you don't have to go back and quote a thousand laws to me on how you have to keep all these commandments. Those commandments no longer have power. Why? Because I now dwell in you. So what good is Christ in you if he cannot keep you? Oh, so Jesus says, Moses told you, you needed all these laws. That was never my will. It's never my will. It was necessary. But it's not my will. My will is what I'm doing at the cross. My will is from this point on, when you come to me and I move into your heart, 
your obedience will be voluntary. Your walk with me will be an internal matter. It will not be a warfare struggle. It is not religion against religion. It is not battle against battle. It's not Muslim against Jew against Christian. So the only way you can prove you're a good Christian is you have to show up to the seven feasts. You have to be in Jerusalem on time. You've got to bring a lamb, a ram, a bullock, a goat. You've got to make sure you've got corn as an offering, wheat as a gift, pour out wine on the days of celebration. The only way you can show you know how to believe me is that when you mess up, you cover yourself in sackcloth and ashes and you cry out to God. The only way you can show that you believe me is when you make a mistake, you're going to put the ash around the doorposts and the lentils. No. Come on, greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes. You got it. So God is trying to reveal to you that everything you need is internal. Now, if you still struggle with that, that means, now I want you to hear me. Depending on your history, depending on the denomination you were raised in or the history you came out of. For many of us who came up um, strong Pentecostal, um, Pentecostal holiness, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, um, for those who came up in other ways of seeing God, for some of you who may have, uh, those who were in Mormonism or Seventh-day Adventist, whatever your, your old connections, you were taught so many religious paradigms of approaching God that now that you've been given this marvelous freedom, it's hard to believe that you don't need steps. So now that you come into God, the mindset is I can only approach him if I keep the steps. So we're talking kingdom, but you're still thinking religion. You're thinking steps. You're thinking models of man. So now the same is true for many of my dear Jewish brothers and sisters, Catholic brothers and sisters, old fashioned Pentecostal. Listen, I grew up Pentecostal holiness. We had steps. Uh, you were sanctified, but you had to come to the altar for this amount of time. You had to pray a certain way. You had to let, uh, unless this one laid hands on you and the bishop spoke this over you, you had to dress a certain kind of way. Women couldn't wear any makeup, no jewelry. Uh, a woman couldn't speak on certain days. She could only speak on these days. She couldn't be over a man in rulership. If a man stood up to speak, he had to speak a certain way. He had to give honor to all the people in the house. You had to say certain words before you began. We all had different religious bondage. Now that bondage that was in us kept us from understanding the kingdom because the kingdom that Jesus brought has a different mindset. He brought a kingdom into a manger. He brought a kingdom into a barn. He sets up a throne in the middle of animals. He's reconstituting the garden that was lost in a manger that was built. He's rebuilding the kingdom. As he's rebuilding the kingdom, he now makes clear to us for 30 years as he walks with his natural father that he is here to represent another kingdom. Heaven opens and heaven declares the representative of the kingdom is present among you. Now the representative of the kingdom is now revealing the voice of the king. So everything he now says is to reveal the kingdom. He's the face of the kingdom. Okay. What does that mean? It means every other prophet is less than Jesus. Every other teacher is less than Jesus. Jesus now is the face of the kingdom. So this has to be understood. Because if you don't settle your heart that Jesus is the face of the kingdom, Yes, we got to undo mindsets. If you don't understand that Jesus is the face of the kingdom, you will compare Jesus with other models and you will look for what's better or worse. So now, is the Pope better than having a cardinal? Is it better to have a cardinal than a bishop? Is it better to have a bishop or a conclave? Do we need a conclave or a gathering? Is it better to have an apostle over you or to have a prophetic covering? Is it better to have a prophetic covering or 
just a pastoral group? Should I have a pastoral group or denomination? So now you are comparing Jesus with all the other models you've seen, and you're looking for whether he's better or they're better. And depending on what suits your purposes, you yield to what you've seen. But Jesus and Jesus alone is the face of the kingdom. We are all representatives of the king, but only Christ is the face of the kingdom. What does that mean? No one gets to interpret the kingdom through their mind, their idea, or their pain. Jesus showed us the kingdom and Jesus alone. So I'm going to say something very simple. So many of us, depending on the denomination history we went through, we carry the pain of that into our future. And we make statements like, it's hard for me to go to church. It's hard for me to find the church because of all the wounds I've received. But Jesus is the face of the kingdom. Jesus never hurt you. I can love God, but it's, I'm having a hard time loving his people. But he never asked you to put his people above him. If you keep loving him, loving his people is not difficult. So Jesus is the face of the kingdom. The Lord speaks to you and asks you, will you go and love people on the street? Will you love people on the corner? Will you love them in the prison? Will you love the, will you love the people who have wounded you? And you say, I would, but I can't. I'm having a hard time forgiving them. But he asks only that you do his will. So you're struggling because you keep seeing them, but the face of the kingdom is him. So you took your eyes off of him to look at them. You took your eyes off of him to see what they were doing. You focused on their rebellion, their mindsets, their issues. And you've gotten so focused on how people treat you that you forgot he's been good to you. So are you in the kingdom following him or are you in the gutter following them? Which one is it? You can't be in both. So for everybody who is struggling with unforgiveness, the bondage, the pain, I can't go forward. You don't know what they said to me. I can't serve in church or I can't trust God. I can't go to those nations. I can't minister to those people because you don't know what I've been through. You're in the gutter. Because if you were in the castle with the king, if you were looking at the king, he is so beautiful. He is so magnificent. What they do might hurt me, but it can't stop me because I'm with him. I'm walking with him. I'm looking at his face and I shall behold him. And as I behold him, I shall become just like him. So as I behold him, I only can see your foolishness for a few minutes because I'm beholding him and he's moving into glory. And wherever he's going, I'm following him. So you're over here talking, but he's taking me higher. And you're fighting me, but he's taking me deeper. And you're talking about me, but he's still whispering he loves me. So I can't be in the gutter with you when I'm in glory with him. So are you in the glory or the gutter? You've got to make a choice. If you're in the kingdom and he is the face of the kingdom, then you should be in his face. Watching him, not watching them. So for every place where church comes to a standstill, where ministry is burning to a halt, where people can't get over themselves, you are in the gutter. You are sitting in the trash of their rebellion. You have surrounded yourself with the dung of their foolishness. You have wrapped yourself up in the seaweed of their saltiness. And you are sitting on a garbage pile, covering yourself in mud complaining about how it smells when Jesus is over by a well of living water, giving out, re re um, giving out revolution, giving out restoration, giving out healing and glory. And you could have been washed and clean a year ago. You could have been restored a decade ago. You could have been blessed 50 years ago, but you like the smell of mud because the mud lets you complain about people and being in living water makes you keep your mouth closed. So if you're in the gutter talking about what they're doing to you, that's your choice. You don't know what they did to me. Yeah, because they've done it to all of us. You don't know what they said about me. I don't care what they said about you. They said it about Jesus. They called him a liar, a drunk, a wine giver. They said he was illegitimate. They said he was no good. They said he wasn't worth listening to. They rose up against him. And what did he do? He ignored all their words. 
if you're older than 15, you ought to know how to keep your mouth closed and keep on moving. And if you can't, that's a choice. That's a choice. That's a choice. If you smell like dirt and look like mud, that's a choice. Because I'm too busy looking at him to look at you. <laughs> There's too much glory. So he is the face of the kingdom. He is the voice. He is the face. Now, what's that last piece? He is the voice. He is the face. And he is the demonstration of the king. What is the demonstration of the king? The demonstration of the king means whatever Jesus did and how he did it is how the kingdom works. It's how the kingdom works. Woo! Come on. Yes, come on, Angela Rogers. That's right. So we have to ask ourselves the question. Are we? Yes, because Jesus kept his eyes on the Father. Are we operating like Jesus did? I listen to people continually explain how they believe they're in these different dispensations. And so people explain away why they don't have miracle signs and wonders. And we don't see so many miracle signs and wonders because this is a dispensation of just revelation. And once you get more knowledge, you don't need miracle signs and wonders. Well, that's stupid. That's stupid. That's stupid. I'm not going to try to explain it. It's stupid. It's dumb. It's idiotic. It's backwards. That's boo-boo foo-foo. That's, that's just cockeye. I would use the other words, but I don't want to offend nobody. But that's just stupid, stupid, stupid. Ten levels of dumb, 15 kinds of stupid. People say, well, you know, this person moves in a deeper prophetic anointing and they always get words. Yes, some are going to move deeper than others because that's their call an assignment, but everybody is prophetic. Everybody has permission to heal the sick and they that believe shall heal the sick and cast out devils. That's a believer's grace. That's not a ministerial grace. That's a believer's grace. Every believer. So now we have to be clear. The sign. Now hear how I say this. <laughs> That's what I said. I said it's cockeyed. It's cockeyed, bow-legged, foo-foo, poo-poo. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is the sign? I did, I said caca. I said caca and caca. Mm -hmm. We throwing it all out there today. Ah, okay. I gotta calm down, I'm gonna get excited. Yeah, I'm gonna say somebody's supposed to say so. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love y'all. Y'all just, y'all push me. Y'all like, just go ahead, just go ahead, okay. Now the sign of salvation is a changed heart. I want to be clear. It's not a changed tongue. It's a changed heart. The sign of salvation is a changed heart. Now, if your heart changes, your life changes. So this is why the Bible says, do not say you know me and you cannot love those who are around you. If your life has never changed, you are not born again. That's not me judging you. That's you revealing your heart. So this idea that we have in this generation where everybody who says they're saved, we simply believe them. You have to understand that the, the sifting agent in the kingdom is God reveals hearts by life. So we know what you have chosen by your life. If no part of your life changed, you are not born again. Okay, so the sign of salvation is a changed heart. The proof of a changed heart is a changed life. That's number one. The sign of the Holy Spirit in filling, in filling, the sign. Many people now say, well, you know, it's just that your life gets better. No, the sign of the Holy Spirit's in filling is tongues, tongues. Now, we barely talk about this anymore, but it's necessary. It's tongues. The evidence of the Holy Spirit coming into you in the very beginning is a tongue. Why? This is important. Kingdom. Kingdom. So why is the proof of salvation a changed heart? Because before you were born again, you were in a different kingdom. 
So what puts you in this kingdom? Come, thank you. So what puts you in this kingdom? What puts you in this kingdom is the promise that God spoke to Jeremiah, which then shows up for Isaiah, which is then reiterated by the mouth of Christ. What is it? I shall take out of you the heart of stone. I shall put into you a heart of flesh and you shall be my people and I shall be your God. So the sign of salvation is a heart, heart, heart transfer, hey! a transplant. The sign of the salvation of the soul is the kingdom transplant, heart to heart transplant that Jesus on Calvary took his heart out of his chest. And when you come to Calvary and say, I want to be saved, he transplants his heart into your heart. There is a kingdom transplant, heart to heart, so that you're not trying to be different. You have to be different because you've got a new heart inside of you. You didn't talk your heart into being different. You didn't convince yourself to be loving. You didn't convince yourself to be better. He snatched your old heart out of your chest. He pulled up out of your belly, your old nature, and he took his own heart full of mercy and grace, full of long suffering and patience, full of authority and glory. And he pulled his heart and pushed it through the very ability. He pushed it past your flesh. He pushed it past your emotion. He pushed his heart into the very cavity inside of your chest and said, live. And his heart began to beat. And the life of heaven began to pump through your veins. And the life of the Father began to flow through your very organs. And suddenly, my eyes began to see different. And my ears began to hear different. And I could love those I couldn't love. And I could do what I couldn't do. Because I got a heart transplant from heaven. So the sign of salvation is a heart transplant. If you don't have a new heart, you are not in this kingdom. Period. I don't care how long you've gone to church. It doesn't matter how much you say you know God. The sign of salvation is a heart transplant. <laughs> hey, glory to God. So if you don't have a new heart, you're a good church goer, but you're not saved. <laughs> you might be a good giver, but you're still going to hell. You might have been coming every Sunday for the last 20 years. That's fantastic. That's marvelous. That is a thousand and twenty. No, that's a thousand forty Sundays. Woo! You still going to hell. You're going to go to hell knowing scripture, but you're going to burn like a piece of chicken. The only way to enter into the kingdom is through a heart transfer. You got to have a new heart. Now, once you have this heart transplant, the next sign when you begin to receive the kingdom and it says, and they spake with new tongues. Yes, you say you love me, but your heart is far from me. The only thing he says, oh, girls, do I have your heart? When you stepped into the kingdom, did you give me your heart? Did you give me permission to cut out of your chest the old heart? and then to implant into you a new heart. Did you let me have your heart? Now, the second thing is when you come into the kingdom, now I didn't say the sign that you had power, I said the sign that you have the Holy Spirit. See, any believer can have access to power, that's by faith. So let me divide the two. You can work miracles without being filled with the Holy Ghost. You only need faith. They that believe shall heal the sick. They that believe shall cast out devils. They that believe shall raise the dead. You only need to be a believer. It didn't say you needed to be filled, just believe. So being a believer, I have seen people with great faith who never were filled with the Holy Ghost until years later. I saw a man raise the dead who had not yet received the Holy Ghost. He was preaching. He was a good evangelist. 
And in his meeting, a man dropped dead. He was one town over from me. I was in another country preaching. And he cried out. He said, God, I believe your word is true. I'm a believer. And he walked to the man and said, arise in the name of Jesus. And the dead man got up. Okay. They had 2,000 people. I think it was like 2,300 saved that day because the people saw the miracle of God. Now, when I met the man, we were all having lunch. He was sharing the story and he was telling me how much he loved God. But I said to him, I see this thing over your head. It's like you get nightmares. He said, oh, yes, I still struggle with nightmares sometimes. He said, and, and I pray, I get up and I rebuke the devil. I said, well, that shouldn't still be happening to you. I said, the Holy Ghost will keep you. And he said, okay. And then I stopped. I said, have you received the Holy Ghost? He said, I think so. I said, you think so? I said, oh, brother. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, have you ever grabbed a live wire? When I was a little boy, I'll never forget. Um, I was visiting um, one of my cousin's homes and they had this beautiful um, stove, but there was a socket that had been exposed and they were fixing the socket. And you know how kids are. One of the cousins said to me, I dare you to take that butter knife and stick it into that socket. And so I, okay. So I ran over and I took the little butter knife and I stuck it in there. Let me tell you something. I saw angels and Jesus. I saw people who had long been dead and people who ain't even been born. I, I, I saw candy canes dancing. I did. I, I saw gingerbread men doing the electric slide. I saw mooses with hats and deers with little elbow dances. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> I put that, I hit that electric wire, that live wire and yeah. Okay. Now, no one had to explain to me that I had touched something with power. Nobody had to explain to me, Michael, do you think that when you touch that wire that was exposed, do you believe something happened to you? Or was it just a mental affectation? Was it simply a dream in your mind? Oh, no, no, power hit my body. Okay. Now, greater than electricity, greater than a neutron electron interaction, greater than a bomb being exploded, greater than a scientist splitting an electron or a neutron, greater than a bomb going off. The spirit of the living God, the creator of worlds, the maker of galaxies, he chose to come and indwell you. You think you have him. If you think you have him, you don't have him. I know, I can tell you the day when he took up residence on the inside of me. I can tell you the moment when the power of the Holy Ghost filled my being and overflowed my mind. I can tell you when he became so rich on the inside of me that I could not speak English. I couldn't even speak for several hours. I can tell you when I felt like my teeth were chattering and my tongue was loose on the inside. When my hands became electrified, I can tell you when I couldn't focus on anybody in the room because I felt like I was swimming in liquid love and somehow he had enraptured me and my mind was drunk on power from on high and my belly was filled with ecstasy and suddenly beyond my mind, beyond my intellect, out through my mouth came a language I could not understand and my tongue became a witness to my belly. My belly knew heaven had come in and my tongue became a testifying agent that Up out of my belly came a language I could not understand the sign that you have received the infilling of the Holy Ghost is a new language. Now, why? Something that has to be understood about kingdom theology. Hey, come on, Gifty Edwards. Just go ahead and type in tongues. I feel the Holy Ghost. Now, a kingdom has something about it. I want you to think with me just for a moment. And my goodness, I, I'm going to teach this and then we're going to have to stop. Woo! 
this has been fun. I, 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 I understand. I hate that I missed Thursday, but I understand what the Lord was doing because he's been just talking to me. This is a phenomenal class. Oh, uh, my God. I feel the Holy Ghost. Okay. When you look at a kingdom. Hey, Angela Rogers said the forecast is rain. <laughs> Listen, I'll teach as long as y'all want to hang. I'll keep teaching. Okay. <clears throat> Let me talk about language. Let's just flow it Saturday. All right now. Something that was true about Israel. If you understand the history of Israel, there is something that is called the diaspora. Now, that is a word that is used for the Jewish people, but it's also used for the African people that went into slavery, the diaspora. For many of you that know that term, it becomes very useful now. If you don't know it, hold on to that. Even write that down and look it up. Diaspora. D-I-A-S-P-A-R-A. -A -A. The diaspora is a term that means those who were scattered who belonged to one nation. Yes. Thank you. The diaspora. So those who were scattered who belonged to a nation, those who were scattered who were of a geographical location or geographical group who were cast out to other nations, normally by force, by violence, or by invasion. Yes, yes. Many of our people have gone through this. So what it means, thank you, dispersion or spread of a people from their original homeland. Now, when a diaspora takes place and you are cast out from your own land, there is something that was instituted by the Jewish people that has belonged to many other cultures since then. What was the thing that they held on to, whether it was in Armenia or in Israel, whether it's happened even in Turkey, or in other parts of the world, whether it happened in Ghana, the Gold Coast, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya. It happened in so many parts of the world that what became true to us was this. That when a nation is under great violence, three things they do. Number one, hold on to your culture. Hold on to your culture. Hold on to that which speaks of your past. So hold on to your culture. How do you hold on to your culture? When people who were cast out of their own countries, out of their nations, and they would go out, they would hold on to their culture <coughs> by events. So when they would come together, the Jewish people or other cultures, you would have meals together. You would remind each other. You would say to each other, we come from a different land, but even in this land, we shall eat our meal together. The Jews, that's why it is so important that on Friday nights, they would always, in many cultures, they would keep Seder together and they would sit together for different African cultures or Armenian people or people, Jewish ancestry, wherever you come from, to come together in another place to remember and to remind each other that we are still our people. Though we have lost our land, we did not lose ourselves. That is one great idea. Yes. Come on, Appy. Thank you. Yes. So you hold on to the culture by you remind yourselves who you are. And you would keep your stories. You would remind each other to find people who are of your own culture. And this is where many people forget this. So when you would come to a new nation, you weren't rejecting the truth of that nation, but you would seek someone who came from your old country and intermarry, not because you were hating being an American or being a Canadian or being an Australian or being English. You were trying to keep alive a culture that was being persecuted. You were trying to keep alive a memory that was dying in the earth. And I say this so, so many times and people, we will keep alive pandas. We will fight to keep tigers alive, but we'll get angry when someone from Armenia or from a small country in Africa says they want to marry someone of their own country. I don't feel like anyone is rejecting me by saying they want to marry someone who came from their own culture because we will keep alive a panda. We'll spend 
$10 million to keep a fish alive that's dying in the earth. But we will hate on people who want to keep their culture alive when they are a dying breed. We've got to think different. As long as it's not based on racism, but you just want to keep something like, if you can value me for who I am, I have no reason to undervalue you just because you're trying to keep a culture alive. That's what the Jewish people understood. When they left their country, they said the only way to keep our kingdom alive is to keep our culture alive. Now, hear where I'm going. So it was in the Bible. You have to keep your culture alive. The second thing you have to do is keep alive the remembrance of those things of value. One of the things that happened after World War II that was so important was for many of the people who came out of, whether it was old French culture, Portuguese culture, um, Jewish culture, British culture, they had to find many of the lost artifacts that had been taken. Now, it's not just what happened in World War II. You go all the way back in society in great times of war, in times of genocide or death, in times of great persecution. The things that would happen was that the art, the collectibles of different nations would be stolen. And so one of the things that would happen is that people would go and find that art and they would then seek to return it. And so many of you have heard the stories and you've seen how over time, some of the great collectibles would be fine and they would then have stories. Yes, Samantha Dordich, we're, gro we're going there. You know where I'm going, hold on, hold on. You know where I'm going. <laughs> so they would find the things of value. This is same in the kingdom. In the kingdom, it says this, remember the Lord's words. Remember his promises. So what does God say? God says, the art that I have given you are promises. Ooh. I've given you a structure. Don't let every other nation of the earth that when they come into the kingdom of God and they bring their ideas, don't let them change the structure. For what I've given you is a structure, the tabernacle, the way of approaching me. I'm not telling you to be religious. I'm telling you that these things I give you, they're the art of heaven. It's the beauty of seeing me. And if you let everyone make you throw these things away, you will forget how to see me. For I have let the prophets paint me. They've caught glimpses of my glory that they might reveal to you who I am. And when you come to me, if you let everybody else steal the art of my presence, and now they put me in the museum of their intellect so that they tell you how to see me instead of you seeing me through the book. You will now only see me based on their mindset. So you're gonna lose who I am. So you've gotta give the artwork back to those that I've given you. Yes, Gifty Edwards. So Jesus says, when he gave us communion, when he gave us the power of God, when he gave us the truth of the Beatitudes, all of these things were the art of heaven, the way to see him. He's the face of the kingdom. So he says, I give you these things. Don't let everybody else steal from you who I am. I gave you how to see me. This is who I am. I give you communion. As often as you do these things, remember me. What is he saying? Every time you do this, take a picture of me again. See me as who I am. Get the photo album out and look at my face again so you'll never let anybody else tell you who I'm not. Every time you break the bread, see me. Every time you drink the wine, see me. Every time you come together, see me. Every time you worship, see me. Every time you do this, I will paint a new picture upon the wall. And you shall behold me. But if you lose these things and the value of these things, anybody 30 years from now can tell you I'm somebody I'm not. And you won't even recognize me because you stopped refreshing 
you know how when we're working with the computer right now, if your screen ever gets frozen, what do you do it? They call it refresh the screen. Doop, you hit that little curve and it, it spins a little bit and then boop, it's back. It's refreshed, okay? When you stop meeting God in the place, he said, come on that F5 button. When you stop meeting God in the place that he said he reveals himself, your screen gets stuck. And suddenly you only see God based on who he was 20 years ago. You only see God. Yes, this all goes with ask, seek, knock. You only saw God based on who he used to be. So now, come on, Angela Rogers, put that up on the screen. They need to see that. So suddenly we forget how to see God. We forget. And suddenly, based on old knowledge, we no longer encounter a right now God, a present God, a true and living God, because we're stuck. We're stuck in yesterday's picture because we forgot to refresh our vision. As often as you do these things, as often as you refresh your vision, as often as you refresh your heart, you will see me and you'll see the people. This is why we don't always know how to love each other in church. Why? When was the last time in your church everybody got down and washed feet? I don't mean somebody washed your feet. I mean, when's the last time you got down? When's the last time you got down and washed the feet of somebody you don't like? Do you know, in, in the church I grew up in, we had communion regularly, but we also did foot washing at least three to four times a year. And the men would wash the feet of the men and the women the feet of the women. And here's what I love. Bishop would always say, now find someone that you have an alt against. Find somebody you don't like. Find somebody you can't work with that you know. He said, and don't pretend to be holy. We all know y'all don't like each other and now go wash each other's feet. And we would watch people struggle. But thank God that as often as you do this, hey, come on, Nathan Zink, he said, I'm gonna grab some communion right now and partake, yes. And we would watch people watch, and I would watch the tears come. And people who couldn't speak to each other before service, people who'd been mad with each other for months, they would start to wash each other's feet and they start to weep and then they'd hug each other and say, I'm sorry. I don't know why I've had an issue. Whatever the issue, we're gonna leave it right here. And here's what we were taught, leave it in the water. Once you wash their feet, leave it in the water. Even if they bring it up next week, you don't bring it up, leave it in the water. And when we would get up and take the buckets of water out, we dump the water buckets outside on the ground. We didn't pour it down the drain. We dump it on the ground and we'd say, God, we pour out this water before you like an offering. I refuse to bring up my sister's issue or my brother's offense. I'll never bring it up again. I choose right now that as we pour out this water, let it be sin against me. If I remind you next week about what I washed off of them today, I forgive. I let it go. I humble myself. I bless them. Act like Jesus and leave it in order. Come on, Joshua Rollinson. And I watch churches be built. And I watch people walk together who said they could never walk together. I watch women who used to hate each other do ministry together a few months later because we kept leaving it in the water. Hey. Leave it in the water. See, the kingdom works, but you've got to understand kingdom principles. This is the kingdom. Can I wash the ankles? You know what, Gifty Edwards, if you was here, I'd throw something at you right now. Right now. I ain't messing with them ankles now. Some of y'all got cankles. I'm not messing with them ankles. But we have to understand that 
when Jesus did something, remember Jesus washed the feet. And he said, if I don't wash your feet, I have no part of you. What was he saying? This act of washing feet is how you see me. It's the kingdom. Everything Jesus did was a revelation of how to make the kingdom rest among us. Ask, because we didn't ask. We haven't asked God, why should we wash feet? We didn't ask, what is communion really about? We didn't ask, why should we be forgiving so much to each other? Because we didn't ask, we didn't seek. We didn't seek to be humble. We didn't seek. When we have conferences, oftentimes I'll bring up and say, I want to wash feet. And I'll get down and wash feet. And I thank God, Deborah, oh, my, my dear friend, Deborah is on here. And I thank God for Deborah. Deborah, many times that we've had conferences, Deborah, Sandra, a few of the others, they're the only ones that will get down and wash feet with me. We'll be washing feet. I thank God for Danny and for Wendy, people who've been there and y'all have helped. But I'm talking about down through the years. Oh, bless you, Angela Rogers. Yes. It's a life-changing moment. And I thank God for the privilege. But I thank God I watched others who, uh, men and women of God, I've known through the years. Do you know I know preachers and pastors who've never washed feet? I'm talking about I ain't never seen them because they're too proud. And they don't understand. That's why there's a mess in the church. They don't understand. That's why there's no breakthrough. It's a spiritual act with an earthly manifestation. It's a spiritual act with an earthly manifestation. Jesus was the manifestation of the king, the demonstration of the king. As the demonstration of the king, then whatever he did, that is the will of the king. However he acted, that is how he wants us to act. So I say to many of you, don't try to be like your favorite preacher. Be like Jesus. Don't go to some church that's phenomenal and figure out how to become great, how to become the next guy on the platform. That'll only be good as long as they have money, opportunity, and reach. Do it Jesus way. Jesus is the revelation of the kingdom. It is a spiritual act with an earthly manifestation. When you do what he does, like he does it, oh, heaven bows down to meet earth. And in the middle of that act of obedience, he changes lives. He uproots, pulls out, and destroys every yoke and bondage that has been in people's lives. He will put back in and on people everything they have lost for generations. And he will anoint, he will empower, and he will glorify if we choose to do it his way. His way above all else. His way. His way. His will, his way, his glory. This is life in the kingdom. To ask. Prayer. Supplication. By the reading of the word and in worship, to seek, to then choose to dig in, to research, to be developed, to look for a mentor, to let someone speak into you, to knock, to then apply the pressure by utilizing the gift that is in you and walking in the power of the kingdom. To understand that in the kingdom, that's what Jesus was doing himself. The wise men asked. Where shall the king be born? They sought. They studied the stars. Ah, then they knocked. Oh, Herod, where is this king? That is the revelation that we're grabbing a hold to today. That is what he's pouring into us. That that simple phrase is the kingdom life. To ask, to seek, to knock. That is what leads us into the Sermon on the Mount, which we will dig into this coming Thursday. And um, I tell you, I, I'm loving this and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, we're going to keep doing the Thursday, but I'm also trying to figure out whether to throw in maybe one Saturday per month or something, because uh, Saturday seems to be also a great time for us to just uh, early Saturday morning to dig in, to ask questions as well. But every Thursday, we're going to keep digging in. This is, I love this. 
And when we get into the Beatitudes, listen, if you think the revelations you've been hearing have been phenomenal, we're going to hit the Beatitude. So Matthew 5 is where we're going this coming Thursday. You are going to run around. You're going to knock a hole in your own wall. Some of y'all need to make sure your dogs, your cats, and your children are out of your way. I'm talking about have run in space. We're going to dig. You have never heard the Beatitudes talk like we're going to teach this. And, oh, Deborah, bless you. It's my honor. It's my honor. And um, I just love it. As you say, phenomenal, Shanae. Oh, amen, my friend. Happy waiting for your mentorship program. The mentorship program is starting soon. Um, that's going to be connected. We're going to keep digging into this. The mentorship program is going to be for those who truly feel called to ministry and to leadership. We're going to start. I'm going to start. I've got a what I call life, uh, excuse me, legacy for leaders, legacy for leaders. And so that's a course I had a long time ago that the Lord has been speaking to me to start up. So that we're going to start and that's going to be a whole nother level. We're going to talk about that's going to be one key thing that every leader needs to understand. And we're going to dig into it. So it's going to be crisis management, how to speak to people who aren't listening, how to deal with pressure. How do I decompress and detoxify? How do I build myself without looking small? How do I overcome a small mindset? How do I help my family deal with me growing? I'm going to dig into all of that. It's going to be things I wish people had taught me. So I've been probably for 20 years, things we taught in leadership classes over the years, the legacy for leaders. And we're going to dig into it. And that's a whole nother class that we're going to teach along with it. And so because many of you, you're on the edge of becoming world changers, uh, but it's just time. Come on. <laughs> Laura Shula said, can't wait, Rabbi. It's my joy. I told you the Lord said this year is about giving y'all tools. So I'm going to teach as much as I can. I'm going to teach as often as I can. I'm going to pour out as much because I want to see y'all win. I want to see you overcome. I want to see you. My goal is a year to three to five years from now to just watching each one of you in your businesses, your ministries, to see you on news programs, to see you being interviewed, to see you, your books being out there. And, and I don't need anybody to, you know, in the back of the book, giving credit to this and that. I'm not doing it for that. I just want to be able to see you do it and to be able to smile and say, God, I thank you. There's fruit. There's life that your people are doing what God said to. I just want to see it happen. That's all. That to me is all I want to see. I don't need nobody to write my name and he knows my name and I'm good with that. I just want to see y'all win. I'm tired of seeing good people not have breakthrough because everybody who's teaching, we're too busy trying to be fantastic so we don't take time helping people break through. I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of everybody saying that they'll be there for you and not backing you up. And I told the Lord, I'll do it. If he'll help me, I'll do it. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to help you do it. I want to help you break through. I want to help you. Yes. I want to help you do what you need to do so that when you break through, you can keep breaking through sustainable victory, lifetime goals, and an overcoming mindset. That's what I want to do. Sustainable victory, lifetime goals with an overcoming mindset. That's where we're going. That's right. No more celebrity Christianity. No more pulpit pimps. Nobody else trying to give you great access just so they can use you to make themselves look amazing. Uh, I'm done with that. People need to be done with that. You ought to be done with that season. If they can't just help you become great because you're worthy, that's enough. Every person who hears the gospel is worthy of overcoming. And just like people help me, I want to help you. There's a lot of people that took the time to sit me down in their front room and talk to me, give me wisdom. People who sat me down and said, that was good, but that don't work. Try this instead. That's what we want to do. Oh, bless you. 
Thank you for seeing through this worldly fray to execute what the kingdom is all about. Danny Shepherd is my great honor. And thank each one of you. Oh, Wendy Mark, that's right. No more spiritual prostitution. Uh, cross over and take that victory. Yes, that's what it's about. It's time for us to do it for real. And if we've learned anything, I've fallen in love all over again with, um, oh, the Jesus series. Why am I forgetting it, the name of it? Um, they just released a new season. The Chosen, thank you. I have fallen in love again with The Chosen. And if you have not seen Jesus Revolution, God in heaven, you have to go see. Oh, it will blow your mind. It's fantastic. It is so good. It is so wonderful. It is life changing. And let me tell you something. What you don't know is some of the people in the Jesus Revolution movie, you may not have their name called out, but some of the people who you see on the screen, the people that they're playing are people we all know. People from some of the churches right here in the desert, the churches up in the mountain, Alby Pearson's people, some of the impact he made. They're people who we have known and walked with. And so to talk to them on the phone and say, that was me driving that car. I was in that meeting. I was there when Lonnie Frisbee called out for the Holy Ghost. It's marvelous. So I want to bless each one of you. Listen, I want you to go and have a marvelous Saturday. Be with your family. Go do something fun, but also take the time to recognize you are who God says you are. You can do what he says you can do. Be blessed this day. And yes, in the UK, um, you may not be able to find it right now in the UK, but there's a couple of websites that you can go on to. Well, wait a minute. Let me not let me not say that because I don't I don't know if them websites are doing it legally or not. I need to go double check. I'll send you a link one way or the other. OK, <laughs> so let me stop before I after we done talk the kingdom, I end up saying something that ain't God. OK, so, yes, yeah, Samaritan's Purse has it. Thank you, Charlene Garrison. Bless you. All right. Y'all be blessed this day. I'm on my way to Chick-fil-A in the mighty name of Jesus. God died that I might live and so did that piece of chicken. So I love you. I bless you. Be blessed. And let's see here. We're going to figure out how to. All right. In broadcast. Yes.